Okay, we're back. We're live. It's five o'clock. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Global Connection. We have Frank Ching on the line from Hong Kong, and we are so happy that he has joined us. Hi, Frank. Welcome to Think Tech. Uh, thank you. Hi, Jay. Good to yeah, see you. Yeah, nice to see you and hear you too. Um, so uh, you, you're a columnist. You're you know one of those uh, larger than life journalists, may I say, um, covering interesting, uh, if not um, globally relevant stories, um, and especially about China and Hong Kong. Yeah, uh, well, and you've been very with various publications. Who are you writing for now? Well, actually, I've been doing this now for several decades. Uh, I I started writing a column in the Asian Wall Street Journal uh, in the nineties, eighties, uh, and and then I wrote a column in the Far East Economic Review. I wrote one in the South China Morning Post, uh, and now I write occasionally in the South China Morning Post, not regularly. I, I still write a weekly column, but it appears in uh, the English language um, uh, edition of the Hong Kong Economic Journal, mm -hmm. which is really a Chinese paper. Now, very often they run my column in English in the Chinese newspaper itself, which looks very odd. <laughs> well, it's, it says something, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I would like to offer, and you don't have to respond, but there's really nobody like Frank Ching in the world. You're really, you're really special, and you cover a beat that nobody covers in the same degree and, and with the same sophistication. Yeah. So we're going to talk about Hong Kong and China today, and since you're in Hong Kong, uh, one of your uh, recent uh, columns you referred to it uh, as in a state of endgame. <laughs> Ah. And I guess that means the new the new security law. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, you know, uh, uh, the national security law was uh, drafted by China, passed by the Chinese uh, parliament, uh, not by the Hong Kong Legislative Council, and then sort of imposed on Hong Kong. It was promulgated in Hong Kong and came into law immediately before anyone in Hong Kong had a chance even to read it. Uh, it was a little weird because even the chief executive, Carrie Lam, I think never had a chance to read the law before uh, it became the law. <laughs> very, very odd. Uh, and then it came into uh, full effect on July 1st. Actually, 11 o'clock at night the night before. Uh, but then on July 1st, she had a press conference and CNN asked her, uh, is it illegal for anyone to criticize the national security law? And she went on to, well, that's a matter of freedom of speech. So if you want to criticize it, uh, you have the right to do that. Unless, of course, you're part of a plot or you, or you have some, some uh, other uh, thing in mind, like overthrowing the Chinese government or overthrowing the Hong Kong government. So uh, it's not clear to me to what extent it is legal to criticize the national security law. Because you, you know that... Uh, Hong Kong was going to have an election in September next month. It's now been delayed for a year. But before the announcement of the delay, there were candidates who had declared themselves, put themselves forward. And those candidates had to be screened by the government's so-called returning offices. And Joshua Wong uh, was not allowed to run because he had called this law a draconian law. <laughs> now. It seems to me that calling it a draconian law uh, is just a uh, description. Maybe it's a criticism of the law, but then criticizing one aspect of a law doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you don't accept that it's a law, that it's legal, you have to abide by it. But because he said that, he wasn't allowed to run for the legislature. So it seems to me that uh, uh, I, I would like to get this clarified. Like if I write an article and call the law draconian, Am I committing an offense? It's really not very clear to me. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe uh, you wouldn't be able to run for office, Frank. Uh, well, that's a friend. I have no, I have no <laughs> ambition uh, to run for office in Hong Kong. But uh, uh, will, will, will the uh, National Security Police come and take me away? Yeah, well, this is, you know, so the, really the question is, uh, had, the, the First Amendment was strong and vital in Hong Kong until recently, um, even over the handover, and, um, and it would have been, except for some of the moves that the PRC has made. 
Uh, and so now the, the question is, is there a First Amendment left or is everyone terrified? Not just Joshua Wong, but anybody who's heard the Jimmy Lai story, um, they would be afraid to make statements, uh, even, if, even if they're Hong Kong elsewhere, right? If they make a statement elsewhere that violates the national security law, then they're in violation of that. It's very scary. So the question is, uh, what has happened to the First Amendment, to the freedom of well, speech? The well, the, the national security law has extraterritorial uh, reach. That is, it's not confined to Hong Kong. If you do anything in Hawaii, for instance, uh, you can commit an offense. And if they catch you in Hong Kong, you can be charged under the national security law. Uh, that is, anyone of any nationality saying or doing anything anywhere in the world can be charged, can commit an offense against this Hong Kong law, uh, which is really very broad. Uh, I, I know of very few instances of this. Uh, and, and I think that it would be good if they could clarify this. You know that the Hong Kong police uh, reportedly have issued uh, a warrant for the arrest of I think six or seven people at this point. And one of them is an American citizen who lives in Washington, DC. <laughs> and, and he's lived there for the last 20, 25 years. Oh. Uh, and, and they accused him of colluding with foreign forces. Now, the foreign forces he's been colluding with is the US government. That is, he's been trying to persuade his own government to do something about Hong Kong. And this is now considered a crime in Hong Kong by the Hong Kong government. <laughs> well, I would be uh, I would be terrified. I mean, how do how are people reacting to the Jimmy Lai arrest? Uh, and what you know, what is what is likely to happen with him? Is he going to be moved to the mainland for trial and punishment? Uh, what's going to happen? We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, this is this is what's so scary because everything is sort of uh, opaque. Uh, we don't we don't know what course of action they'll take because they have they have choices. Uh, the mainland under the law, the mainland uh, can if it chooses have him sent to the mainland for investigation and trial. Uh, and if the mainland thinks it doesn't want to do that, then the mainland can allow the Hong Kong authorities to investigate and and charge him. So so far. Uh, as I understand it, it's only uh, been done by the Hong Kong police, but the mainland can step in at any time. Well, this is this is pretty scary for the ordinary person, you know, ordinary resident of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I imagine a lot of those people who are out there with the umbrella movement and, and who protested the national security law in the first um, have probably backed off because they would be afraid of being arrested. Don't you think this has broken the back of, of the uh, protest movement? I, I think it has, but of course, it's been assisted by COVID-19. <laughs> there are no protests in the streets because nobody's gathering uh, in the parks or the streets, holding rallies, demonstrations. And, and by law now, uh, you cannot have more than two people gathered uh, together. <laughs> so, <laughs> even, even when the restaurants are open, they're only allowed to see two people at any one table. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so in that environment, you cannot really have a protest. And I think this is going to go on for quite a long time. Well, as time goes by, I think it will take root change the culture, don't you, in, in Hong Kong. Well, that vitality in Hong Kong will, will change and it, it yes. just won't be the same place anymore. Uh, yes, and, and the arrest of uh, Jimmy Lai and, and the raid on the Apple Daily newspaper, you know, going through journalist uh, files, uh, yeah. this, would, this is definitely going to have a chilling effect on the media in Hong Kong. Uh, they, the police said that they had to look at what's there to know what to seize, so uh, that their intention was not to disrupt the work of the reporters. But of course, uh, that was the effect. and. Yeah. and Sure. I think people are afraid of what to write, and certainly what to write in the Apple Daily. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Apple Daily staff seems to be uh, undeterred. The Apple Daily keeps publishing. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but the day after the raid on the Apple Daily, the, the demand for the paper was so great. <laughs> Normally, they, they have a print run of 70,000. 
the next day, people were standing in line to buy the paper, and they had to print like five times that uh, number of papers <laughs> to satisfy demand. People were standing in line from two o'clock in the morning on, waiting for the paper to come out. <laughs> That's a statement, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that was one way of showing their their moral support for the paper. Sure. And another another thing was that a lot of investors, people bought shares in the company, next media company. The, the, the value of the company went up a thousand percent. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> but now the government is investigating who these investors are <laughs> and, and see if there are any irregularities. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so uh, it can be very scary. E it even is. what invests can be, uh, can be investigated. Well, you know, there was footage played on local TV about the police, um, you know, going into the paper and, uh, and um, you know, messing everything up, looking through files right. and just right. making a mess. And I said to myself, gee, these, these police, as, as in the street scenes, they're Hong Kong people. I don't yes. understand why a Hong Kong person would take a job, be a policeman and be so mean <laughs> to other Hong Kong people. Do you have an explanation for that? Uh, well, they are the police. They, I guess, from their standpoint, they're doing their job. Uh, also, the, the police now have been given more powers. They've been given a lot more money, <laughs> increased funding, uh, and they have been given uh, additional weapons that they didn't have. Now, a lot of countries are no longer selling weapons to Hong Kong, including uh, the United States, the UK, and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. but they can get whatever weapons they want from the mainland. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're being now trained by the mainland. Uh, they used to get training from the United States, the Hong Kong police. That has stopped and they're being trained by the mainland. <laughs> and that also is, a, is somewhat scary uh, that the Hong Kong police are almost directly under the mainland's public security um, department. Well, uh, I've, I've... Go ahead. Uh, so, and I, I think, uh, well, you know, 200 policemen went into the offices of uh, Apple Daily, and they explained that that massive presence by saying that they didn't want to disrupt the work for too long. So if they sent in fewer people, it would have taken them a lot longer. <laughs> so they sent in a lot of people, uh, so, and it only took a few hours rather than the whole day. Oh, oh my God. That, actually, that sounds like something Trump would do, but that's my, my opinion of Trump. <laughs> but let's, let's talk about U.S. relations with China and how that has somehow been, you know, in, 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 embedded in this whole process. Um, yeah. And U.S. relations with Hong Kong, which, you know, courtesy a, a State Department that is run o only by one man. Um, so, Query, what, what is happening with U.S. relations with China and with Hong Kong, and what is the connection? Well, U.S. relations of China, as you, as you know, have deteriorated uh, to, I think, worse than it, it's ever been. Uh, to, so it's certainly worse than any time since the Korean War in the 1950s. Uh, and uh, this is in all, all aspects. It started off as a trade war, then there was a media war and, and then diplomatic war, the closing down of consulates uh, in both countries. Uh, then there's now propaganda war, uh, ideological war, the U.S. Uh, turning, trying to turn people against the Communist Party in China. Uh, and uh, the U.S. is also trying to put pressure on, on Hong Kong, on China in terms of Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, there, I think the U.S. wants to not hurt people in Hong Kong as much, uh, but I don't think I don't think you can help. Not you can help hurting the people in Hong Kong. They're, they're going to be hurt, you know. If you say that Hong Kong will no longer enjoy uh, special treatment in terms of trade, uh, the U.S. Uh, recently said Hong Kong uh, exports to the U.S. can no longer say made in Hong Kong. They've got to say made in China. <laughs> and, uh, so you cannot differentiate between a product made in Hong Kong and made in China. And uh, uh, Hong Kong pointed out that it was a, it's a separate member of the World Trade Organization. In fact, of course, Hong Kong was in the WTO before China joined. <laughs> so why, 
why is the U.S. making uh, one member of the WTO say that its products are manufactured in another member of the WTO? It doesn't. It doesn't sound like uh, U.S. policy toward Hong Kong has been cogent. <clears throat> I mean, what? What if? If um, if if it was cogent, what would it look like? Well, you know, I think that uh, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. You cannot really separate uh, policy towards Hong Kong and policy towards China, because the most powerful weapon in the hands of the U.S. Uh, is the U.S. dollar. Now, uh, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong currency is linked to the U.S. currency, right? Uh, and the Hong Kong dollars, uh, well, one U.S. dollar is roughly 7.8 uh, Hong Kong dollars. And if the U.S. dollar, if the U.S. denies Hong Kong access to the U.S. dollar, uh, it would uh, be able to disrupt Hong Kong uh, and also disrupt China because China uses Hong Kong uh, as a way of getting uh, well, foreign currency uh, in a way. Uh, that it's not that reliant on Hong Kong anymore. It used to be uh, almost entirely reliant on Hong Kong. But if the U.S. were to den deny China access to the U.S. dollar, uh, that would uh, really be a huge challenge to China, but it would be a huge challenge to the United States. You know, People keep saying the U.S. will be more badly hurt than China if it were to do something like that. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, and, and it's true. The, the U.S. and uh, Chinese economies are very much interwoven. And you cannot say, uh, I'll punish you, but it won't affect me. It, it will affect the U.S. Whatever, uh, whenever the U.S. really tries to hurt China. So do you think that, um, that the... Um... Uh, the new security law, the national security law, is a function of Xi Jinping's efforts to improve his control of, of mainland China and part of um, you know, a, a political effort uh, to become more powerful, to uh, grandize his power, protect his power on the mainland, to show the world that he can control Hong Kong. And some people have offered that as a, as a possible connection. What do you think about it? Well, I think that there, there is some uh, aspect of that, but primarily it's to gain control over Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kong last, last year, the, the uh, second half of the year was really out of control. Uh, and uh, the protesters were attacking uh, the Chinese government institutions, uh, throwing the Chinese flag in, in the harbor and you know, burning the Chinese flag, doing all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, uh, Xi Jinping could not allow this to go on. Uh, at the same time, it was having some influence within the mainland. Uh, some slogans used in Hong Kong were also uh, being used on the mainland mm. by small groups of people. But still, you could see that there was some seepage into the mainland of the, this uh, malignant Hong Kong influence. Uh, so I think Xi Jinping wanted to stop that and he also wanted to put Hong Kong under control. Uh, I would say um, putting Hong Kong under control would also increase his uh, control in the mainland. Does, does this uh, ultimately play out in, in, in connection with China's relationship um, with Taiwan? Uh, I know it's not the same, uh, but I, I wonder if uh, it, it bespeaks of a, a plan to expand whatever happens in Hong Kong somehow into Taiwan. Yeah, I think uh, the destiny of Hong Kong and Taiwan are, are linked. And uh, uh, you know that a lot of Hong Kong people are now moving to Taiwan. I mm. think uh, in the last last years, uh, several thousand people moved to Taiwan, three or 4,000 people. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, in Taiwan, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, the president has rejected the idea of one country, two systems, which is the formula that China uses for Hong Kong. And she has said that, just look at Hong Kong today. If we accept one country, two systems, this is what Taiwan will be like tomorrow. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> I'm not sure what I was saying. Uh, Hong Kong today, 
Hong Kong wants to be like Taiwan. So what Taiwan is like today, Hong Kong would like to be like that tomorrow. So, so there, there is a lot of linkage and, and comparisons. Yeah. You, you spoke about people leaving Hong Kong for Taiwan. What about the uh, 300,000 visas that have been promised by the UK? Are people taking advantage of that? Are oh, they moving to the UK? Want, that's almost 3 million, actually. Oh, my 2. goodness. 2.9 million. Okay. It's a very large percentage of the Hong Kong population. They, they're not going to get visas directly. These are people who, are, who already have or are eligible for the British National Overseas Passport. That is people who were born in British Hong Kong before July 1st, 1997. They are eligible for this passport. Uh, the passport itself uh, right now just allows you to go to the UK for a year and then you have to leave. But yeah. uh, what is being proposed now by the government, and I think it's gonna come into effect in January, uh, is that people who have the Hong Kong, have this special British passport, can go to the UK and work there and be granted uh, like work visas for five years. So after they've lived and worked in the UK for five years, then they can apply for citizenship and that'll take another year. So basically, uh, you uh, have to spend at least six years in the UK and then you get uh, UK citizenship. Uh, but they're not gonna hand you a, a visa where you can live uh, in the UK immediately. Hmm. Well, but, I, uh, how, does, how does that break down? I mean, who can take advantage of that? Is that, is that the, uh, what, what side of the divide is that? Are those the wealthy people, the not so wealthy uh, people? Who can do well, it? No, it goes by birth uh, when you were born. Yeah. As if you were born before July 1st, 1997. Yeah. Uh, born in Hong Kong, yeah. then you are eligible for the status of British national overseas. Uh, yeah. If you're born after that, you are not eligible. However, it, sound, it sounds pretty attractive, Frank, uh, and I would imagine a lot of people would take advantage of it. And when you and, uh, and I imagine a lot of people, the people who do take advantage of it will be a great loss to the workforce and the, what do you want to call it, the thought leaders in, in Hong Kong. And that goes to my, my, my next question is, what, what is the end game? How is this going to wind up? It doesn't sound like a good time. No, no. Uh, but I, I think it's good that there is this uh, possibility uh, for a lot of people in Hong Kong to move to the UK if they want to. Uh, but then they have to be uh, financially able to afford such a move. Uh, and of course, uh, jobs in the UK are not easy to come by these days. Uh, you have to go to the UK and, and get a job and support yourself for five years. Uh, that, that is not easy. So I think that uh, nowhere near 5 million or even 10% of 5 million will actually go to the, uh, 3 million will actually go to the UK. Hmm. Uh, but but uh, the, the, from the uh, pro Hong Kong government standpoint, uh, this is good and that the people who leave tend to be the ones who are against the government, critical of the government. Uh, so you have fewer people who vote against the government, who, who will take part in protests, demonstrate and so forth. And in the meantime, there is this constant stream of mainlanders coming in to settle down in Hong Kong. You know, since, since 1997, there have been over a million mainlanders who have come in and the population now seven and a half billion more than a million of that, uh, mainlanders who have come uh, to Hong Kong to live. So this proportion will, will constantly change. And increasingly, the Hong Kong population consists of mainlanders who have come to Hong Kong to settle. And the original Hong Kong people will be moving on to the UK, uh, Canada, Australia, <laughs> the US. It's, it's a displacement somehow, a complete shift. Um, yes. You know, one yes. of the things that I've always um, that I've always understood was that Hong Kong was was a portal to mainland China for capital, for business deals, uh, and the and the capital would come from all over the world. It would go through Hong Kong. There were there was a, a community of finance people in Hong Kong banks and finance people who would place the capital into China. Then Shanghai got to be uh, you know the PRC wanted Shanghai to also do that and. So a thing shifted. The question I have for you is, in the end game, is that going to continue? Is there still going to be a, a capital portal through Hong Kong uh, to the mainland? 
Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, it's continued over the last 23 years. Uh, and, uh, and, and Shanghai can never be, can never replace Hong Kong as an international financial center as long as the renminbi is not fully convertible. Mm. Uh, and right now it isn't. Uh, so they've been talking about, actually 10 years ago in 2010, they said in 10 years, Shanghai will be an international financial center. Well, this is the 10th year and it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Uh, and uh, unless they are going to take a, a really bold move and allow the B to be fully convertible, this is not going to happen. Uh, and I, I don't see this happening uh, in the near future. So I think that they are going to be relying on Hong Kong to continue to, to uh, be a channel for foreign currency. And it's in China's interest to have the uh, the, the banks and the, the bankers uh, stay and continue to do business in Hong Kong. And my understanding is that they have uh, that, that the PRC has incentivized them in some way, given them benefits, so not to oppose uh, the new security law and other uh, PRC moves into Hong Kong. Am I right about that? Well, I think that uh, the PRC uh, has been putting pressure on banks to support the national security law. So even before the law came out, uh, the HSBC uh, came out and supported the law. Uh, Senate China Bank came out and supported the law before they saw it because of Chinese pressure. <laughs> we support the national security law. It tells you a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I think that uh, China wants everybody to think that the impact of the law will only be on, uh, well, a small number of uh, political activists and would not affect <clears throat> So uh, they want to reassure business people that everything is well. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the uh, AMCHAP, American Chamber of Commerce, conducted a survey among its members in Hong Kong. And up to 40% are thinking about whether they should stay in Hong Kong or not. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, unless China can really reassure people that the impact is going to be very limited, uh, you will see uh, over time an exodus of uh, international business. Yeah, it sounds like that's what, that's, that would happen. I mean, I, my next area that I wanted to ask you about was uh, China's image, the PRC's image in the world. I mean, they, they have a, a significant image problem with the Uyghurs and Xinjiang. They, they have, um, you know, obviously a significant problem in Hong Kong, uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, they've been mean. They've been mean and unnecessarily aggressive. Um, and at the same time, though, they've, they've um, mounted a campaign to get more influential in the United Nations. Um, and so you can see that they're really careful about trying to protect their image and, and um, you know, making sure the world doesn't think they're, uh, they're you know, too mean. I wonder how that's going and, and whether it's working um, and uh, whether you think uh, hung, uh, rather the PRC can actually uh, protect itself from uh, a bad image. Well, you know, the, like the Hong Kong issue was discussed in the UN Human Rights Council and the UK uh, had a statement that was supported by maybe 16, 17 countries. And then Cuba had a pro-China statement they were supported by uh, initially by 50 some countries and ultimately by 70 countries. So China is saying it has the support of most countries in the world. Uh, and then you know, what's interesting is that uh, this Cuban statement was not published by anyone except the Chinese uh, mission at the United Nations. <laughs> that is that people were looking for the statement among all these 50 countries that supported it. None of them had published a statement anywhere. And then even the Cubans did not have the statement uh, published in their foreign ministry website. <laughs> so, and then they pointed out that these 50 some countries together accounted for less than 4% of the world's uh, GDP. So, so uh, they're trying to discount this. However, uh, another point of view is that all these uh, Western countries added up together, they only account for like uh, 12, 15% of the world's population. Whereas 80 some percent of the world's population live in countries that support China. 
that is the, the developing countries. Uh, so they, uh, in the UN, I think China uh, can always get a majority on its side in the General Assembly. No question that the, the US cannot compete against China in the United Nations. Yeah, well, that's uh, the US doesn't even trying these days is making all the wrong moves. And my last uh, question to you, because we're almost out of time, Frank, is, um, you know, so there's a fair chance, uh, nobody making any big bets on it, but there's a fair chance that Joe Biden will, will win the presidency in November, uh, assuming we can get by all these process, uh, you know, issues around the post office and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, I, and I wonder, you know, what he should do. It's not easy to repair the damage to our relationship with China. Uh, and, and I say repair, I mean, it's not only um, get friendly, but also, you know, have a, a certain amount of influence and uh, persuasive control on what they do with human rights and so forth. And, and for that matter, what they're doing in Hong Kong. Um, and I wonder what Joe Biden could do, being well advised, uh, in order to make that relationship better than it is now. Well, I think the main thing is that uh, with Trump, he's unpredictable. Uh, you never know what he's going to do next. And I think that uh, China for a long time uh, wanted Trump to win a second term. Uh, you, you know that John Bolton in his book uh, disclosed that Trump had actually asked Xi Jinping for support uh, for his re-election uh, and uh, uh, said that he needed the uh, vote, the farm vote in the U.S. and that the U.S. were to buy more agricultural products, it would really help him. <laughs> and China promised to buy $200 billion from the, from the U.S. Uh, this year and next year. Uh, <laughs> but I think at this point, uh, China thinks that it's better to have somebody that can, uh, they can uh, predict uh, what the person is going to do rather than a guy like Trump who uh, blows hot and cold all the time and never know what he's going to do next. So I don't think that Trump at this point has China's support to get a second term. Now, if Biden comes in, uh, in the, the whole atmosphere in the United States has changed. I think it's, it's a uh, bipartisan thing that uh, the mood towards China has shifted. And there is a general sense of uh, suspicion and uh, I would say hostility towards China. But with Biden, I think that things will return to a, a state of greater normality in that you will have officials appointed. Now, a lot of, uh, when Trump came in, a lot of positions were left vacant, no, no appointments. I think Biden will appoint uh, qualified people. They will not be, not undergo a political screening uh, and they will do what is expected of them in that position and, and not have to show loyalty to Joe Biden in order to do the job. Uh, so I think that the uh, diplomacy of China will return to a more normal track uh, although it would not, I don't think it would be a warm relationship, it would be a more normal relationship, uh, which is uh, the way it should be. I'm with you, Frank. Thank you so much. Frank Ching, a reporter, journalist, columnist, par excellence, reporting on Hong Kong and China for many years. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jay. My pleasure to be here. Aloha.